Yeah, what worries me a little bit is just uh, we're already in the United States and really Canada too. Um, like we're at capacity for uh, growing crops. Like we're using all our available land to grow crops. We can't expand it much more. Um, and if we're taking those uh, that land out of availability for food and placing it into an energy producing industry, then then we become an importer of food, you know, and it kind of it starts to shift the power balance a little bit. So. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Agriculture Podcast. Today we're joined by Ezra Rosebow. Uh, resident farmer here at Denton Farms and uh, also a Canadian farmer. Um, has his own operation in Ontario, Canada. And uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about what differences he sees in American agriculture and Canadian agriculture. And also just uh, his experience with coming to uh, the United States to farm and um, kind of what he went through to get down here and uh, and... Yeah, so I'll just let him introduce himself, and we'll go from there. Yeah, so I'm Ezra, and I'm from southern Ontario originally. Uh, I grew up on a family farm there in Brant County, actually, and all my life I've been there, so that's so tell where people, it all began. Tell people uh, where exactly is Brant County. Uh, so we're uh, about two hours from the... Sarnia, Michigan border. Pretty close to Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. About 45 minutes, probably to an hour from downtown Toronto. So, um, as was telling me that as, uh, time has gone by, Toronto has kind of sprawled out into his, uh, farming areas and his neighbor's areas. So talk about that just a little bit. Uh, yeah. Over the years, it's gotten busier and busier, but when COVID began, and that all started, everybody started moving out of the cities, kind of the sprawl started taking place and farmland went up, houses went up, everything increased dramatically in our area. So the, uh, I guess the <clears throat> subdivisions have came out to the farm. Yep. Yep. Like we have over the years, they've built up, uh, behind my mom and dad's farm, the home farm, and they're right up to our back fence line now. Houses all around. Yep. So on, on one side. Right. Yep. Just uh, uh, just the same thing that uh, all of us are going through here in the United States, where the cities have grown so big, they're coming out into the country areas now. Yep. Yep. So you grew up um, cattle farming. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. My dad and grandpa always had beef cattle uh, way back in the day when my dad was growing up. It was dairy originally and then they had hogs as well with beef cattle when they got out of the dairy when the quota system came in um and dad still has beef cows and finishes also so still in cattle to this day yeah yeah and then uh, when did he row crop as well yep he does row crop still and did ever since the whole time he was growing up with his dad as well so you're uh, not the only farmer in your family. You have other family members that farm. Yep. Uh, I got a couple brothers that do as yeah. well. Yep. Not with you, though, right? No, no, we're all kind of on our own. I guess we help each other, but have our own operations. Yeah, separate operations. Se. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, your dad is separate as well. Yep, he's separate as well. And then uh, talk a little bit about you have a partner that... Uh, that you farm along with some. So too. the neighbor up the road, Ryan, he's, uh, it all, I guess, began with my grandfather and his grandfather. They owned harvest equipment together, helped each other, stuff like that for labor reasons, obviously, and just made more economic sense with equipment, I guess, right, probably like 45 or 50 years ago they started. So that's continued through his dad and my dad. and now him and i as well so that's pretty interesting that's uh, i think that's something you're going to see more of uh with the you know just inflated cost of equipment now and um how big everything is it makes it just uh so you can spread the cost across more yeah. acres and makes yeah. more sense like, like when, especially you have neighbors that really get along good 
Yeah, and when him and I first really got into it, I had uh, I had three tractors at the time. Uh, he had three also. Um, I kind of started looking at the hours I was putting on my equipment, and it wasn't really worth it doing my own stuff. So uh, I'm down to one tractor, and he's down to one, and we help each other in the spring and help each other all through the year and the fall, and we put more hours on less units and but it seems to work out and it helps with labor issues also yeah sure if you got uh somebody that's already farming as well Mm -hmm. i mean i found that with ez here is uh i I don't have to talk to him about uh, what we're doing because he knows how to do every job so i tried (laughs) it's it's nice to have a farmer that is uh already trained and uh knows his business very well and uh is just like you you don't have to uh spend any time showing a guy that already knows what he's doing what to do because he he already knows the process so Mm -hmm. when you have a partner that's helping you i can imagine that's a valuable asset to your farm yeah and it's helping immensely now being down here and investing in the farm down here and still operating in ontario it's makes it a lot easier yeah. I wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible. I wouldn't be able to do it physically yeah. or mentally yeah, and have everything done on time if they weren't there looking after stuff while I was down here yeah, and vice versa. If you weren't here looking after stuff while I was up there. Yeah. So. Yeah. It makes a, uh, like when you've got good partners that just, it, it does ease the burden on mm-hmm. everything. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, talk about your family a little bit. You got a big family. Yeah, uh, what part? <laughs> I'm from a big family. Uh, there was, there is, or was eight kids. I don't know. I still like to think my sister that passed away is uh, still with us. But uh, yeah, that was unexpected. And so that's what it is. And there's seven of us there. Some of us are in agriculture. Some of us are working jobs elsewhere. And then... My wife and I, we have five kids as well. So, so I think it was, uh, was it last year your sister passed away? Uh, or has it been t- two years now? Now you're putting me on the spot. 20, 2022, I guess. 2022. Spring, spring of 2022. Yeah, so as had been here about a year farming. and uh, Not even. Seven months. Yeah, seven I, months. I remember I was in, yeah. uh, in the hardware st- uh, store in Mayfield um, when I heard about it. And uh, like, as a sister, we're... Uh, He's a little younger than me. I'm 45, um, but his sister's around our age, so mm-hmm. it's very unexpected passing. Of, yeah. And they were very close, uh, so that's a difficult thing to go through. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, and then you have a big uh, family of your own as well. Yep. Uh, so my wife, Brittany, and I, we have five kids, uh, two girls and three boys. So. And uh, the, the two oldest boys are here quite a bit. They're... Uh, they're busy. <laughs> they love to farm yeah, as yeah. well. I mean, yeah. they actually they uh, always hitting somebody up for a semi ride, or yeah. tra- so they're mu- very much a chip off the old block. Yep, yep. And the younger Miles, he's starting to get into it too. So Miles is already <laughs> loving the tractors oh, too. Yeah. That's the oh, little yeah. guy. Yeah. How old is Miles? Uh, he just turned four. Yeah. So so Miles, when he let's see, he was about two when he first come around. Yeah. And. Uh, I hadn't got to see him much here lately, but um, I can imagine if, uh, as much as his brothers love uh, <laughs> tractors and ag, uh, I'm sure Miles will follow in their footsteps. Oh, yeah, he's raring to go <laughs> all the time. So uh, talk to us a little bit about the differences you've seen in American and Canadian agriculture. Um, I guess there's a lot, maybe a lot more availability of things uh in the u.s such as like carbon carbon credits stuff like that um a lot more seems to be a lot more opportunity to me um such as like cover cropping and stuff uh agriculture is more looked after that way and it's pushed more per se than where we are uh there was some programs but it was limited so it kind of yeah, you got excited about it, but you did it one year and then it was gone. So there was no incentive to keep on going. Yeah. Uh, really, if you look at it from the perspective that you want to better your soil and the following crop and 
this and that, then you keep on doing it. Like we cover crop a little bit, not everything, probably not what we would if there was more programs available. Um, but we, we try to and limit our erosion the same as here. Uh, the climate is what gets me and diseases, bugs, insects with crops, stuff like that. Weed pressures. It's to me is completely different. It's like it's a head down here and we haven't seen those weeds yet and we're going to be dealing with them <laughs> in the coming years. <laughs> and it's a little bit scary, but it's, yeah, we just deal with what's, what's thrown at us. So, yeah. So it has got bounced right into Kentucky where we have, uh, we have a very warm climate here with a lot of rainfall. Um, but we have all the Southern weeds and, yep. uh, lots of daylight. And yep. so it's really, I don't think if you've ever been uh, through this area or farmed in this area, it's hard to imagine how fast our weeds and grass can grow yeah, and how fast in, a small infestation can become a crop taken infestation. Yeah. Well, and that's, yeah, I mean, it, it amazed me the first wheat harvest I was down here for. And that was, I was like, wow, look at how much everything grew overnight. I think the corn tasseled overnight and it was, it might've grown two feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, I was shocked. I'd never, it doesn't, that don't, it doesn't do that where I'm from. Yeah. But it just, everything is so, I guess, further ahead in the season yeah. than where we're from. So. Right. Yeah. Or longer, uh, um, or I guess more available sunlight. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. you know, we get the, uh, the heat earlier in the season and it sticks around longer late yep. in the season Yep. and to go along with all the sunlight, it is, uh, it can, it is amazing how fast things grow here close to the solstice. Yeah. Just like it is, as is right. You can come out, uh, between, uh, the night and the morning, uh, from the night before. And you're like, wow, that plant has grown. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, was, we were just saying when we were going to town, the, the trees, Last night when I went home, there wasn't no sign of bloom, and they're all bloomed out today. Yeah, like all the flowering <laughs> trees now. Yeah. And we're a little, we're probably a month early here on our flowering trees, but usually this time of year we have our tulip trees blooming, and occasionally you can see a crab apple. Mm -hmm. and, um, like I know just here in the last uh, day or so, I've seen the forsythia blooming, the Bradford pears are blooming. Um, you know, your dogwoods are starting to bud. Yeah. I see the maples getting ready to come out. So yeah. all the flowering yeah. plants and, uh, and early buds are, are already really, I mean, if we were to have a frost, it'd knock them out. Yeah. So. And I don't know. Yeah. And soil, soil wise, I don't, we're lighter soils, I guess, kind of gravelly bottoms and sandier. And we do get into some clay ground, but I've never seen soil move like it does down here. Oh yeah, like, like a, it, it, it. You as much as look at it before a thunderstorm, and it gets up and walks away. That's what I tell people all the time. If you just look at our soil yeah. wrong, it'll it'll wind up in the ditch. So that's a that's another different. We don't have the kind of the need to be persistent on our erosion, I guess, or I don't on my farm in Ontario. Um, we do some tillage, we do some no till. It all depends on our soil types, but uh, down here it's like something you're always constantly watching and keeping an eye on. Yeah. It can get away from yeah. you here really fast and you can have a small ditch that becomes a gully in just mm -hmm. a season. Yeah. It's really kind of unbelievable. Um, talk a little bit about what it took to get, uh, I know it was, a like I've, I've got to was, experience along with us. So I never <laughs> understood how difficult it was to get a U.S. citizenship if you're doing it the right way. It, it sounded easy uh, in the beginning. So I owned, uh, my wife and I, we owned a 50 acre farm in Ontario and we built a house and whatnot. And when our prices went up, it was talked about that maybe we'd see what we could get for it or this or that, and maybe kind of branch out and move to the U S or look for something else elsewhere. Just with land prices, it was hard for expansion, everything. So yeah, I've, found the two farms that I bought down here on the internet and flew down here and looked at them. We looked at other farms as well around different states. Um, we spent four or five days down here and that's when we met. And then we did, uh, 
bought, I guess we bought the farms before we kind of looked into the paperwork and the process and it seemed simple. And really in the end it was, it was just a lot of paperwork and time and that's, it just took a lot. <laughs> the, time a lot is what, time. the time is what I really never yeah. realized is how long it takes to yeah. uh, go through the whole process. Yeah. So and over a year. Yeah. I think we were, well, we started, uh, I guess fall of 21 or right January of 22. And then with a few unforeseen issues and stuff and had to go back to Ontario due to family stuff. And then we, uh, started process kind of over, I guess, while we were up there, stayed there maybe a little bit longer than expected and kind of really got things rolling. And then, uh, once everything got going, everything seemed to pick up, but yeah, we didn't, uh, I wasn't successful in receiving my visas until I guess it would have been September of 23, yeah. August of 23, it roughly was, just before corn harvest. Yeah, it was right before corn yeah. harvest. So I think you made it in here like maybe a week ahead of yeah, corn harvest. Roughly or somewhere in yeah. there. So, but a lengthy process, but yeah, worth it. And I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm just, we're just on visas. So it's, yeah. there's still lots of paperwork, right. ahead, but it's all time. Yeah. Time. So, yeah. Now on the downhill slide. Now. Yeah. So, it's, uh, yeah, that's the long and short of it. It was maybe a little more costly than what I had expected, but that's what it is. If that's what you're doing and that's your game plan, you got to go for it. What's the U.S. <laughs> government? So, you know, they're going to make you pay a pound of flesh well, for the everything. Canadian government's the same way. <laughs> they're all the same. Yeah, they're just governments. They're looking to extract this maximum yeah. funds. Yeah, and they want to make, they want to make sure that you're, they want to make sure you're serious, I guess, or yes. it seemed like it to me. That's what I said. They want me to be broke before they, uh, before they say, here you go, now go to work. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, um, I'm always curious, like the sales pressure and, uh, cause I know here in, uh, Kentucky, the sales pressure is pretty high. Um, I keep a sign to run off the salesman here. <laughs> it's a sales pressure similar in Canada. Um, Yes, in some factors and no in others. Uh, like my fertilizer and chemical salesman um, is basically one of my good friends. Yeah. So um, usually if I want to buy fertilizer in the fall, pre-buy if I can, uh, or I call for a price, he's like, no, nah, don't talk to me. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to see you till April. Yeah. Um Equipment sales, not really. I mean, we're, it's, it's kind of a small knit community and you know, you know, guys and, and they know if you're dealing with a good salesman, they know when you're ready to trade up or right. how big an operation you are, or if something good comes along, you might be interested on trading. Um, it all depends. You get to know them all pretty well, but yeah, there can be people stop in fuel salesmen, everything. Yeah. Right. And it's, yeah, it's, you just kind of keep working and it's the pressure is pretty high around here that's different too it is it's, it gets pretty pretty rapid sometimes <laughs> compared to what i'm used to yeah that but, i always you know that's uh i think it's well i sometimes dread going to work because i feel like you know there's certain like if we're really busy yeah and we get a rain out here yeah then it's like uh, a it's, parade of salesmen yeah they know yep they know yep. yeah but like our yeah like equipment salesmen we know they'll stop in just to stop in and see what's going on on a Friday afternoon or something like that. But same with the fertilizer guys, my seed salesman's Ryan. So I got to deal with them every day. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to get sick of him yeah. again, but I'm not too far away from him at any time. So yeah, I've got my certain guys that, you know, I'm really close to that. I talk to nearly every day that, you know, yeah. that do most of my sales for me. And then, but it seems like we get a lot of guys that I've never even seen once in my life <laughs> or any times in my life and they just pull up here and you know they're just i mean I, from everything from tools to you name it you name it <laughs> yeah so uh in that area are you seeing pressure from the solar and wind people uh wind is when a bunch of wind towers went up i don't know even know how many years ago that would be now i farm a farm down by the lake 
that has a wind tower on it. Uh, there's a bunch kind of down the Niagara Peninsula and then up towards Chatham and towards Windsor and that. They got a lot more of them. But uh, solar, there's a couple solar farms around. I don't know if they're really pushing still for more or not, but not right close in our area at the moment. Hey guys, Clayton here. I'm interrupting your podcast right now to tell you about my media company, Atlas Media Solutions, that uh, makes this podcast possible as well as all the Denton Farms media happen. So I'm going to play a quick ad real quick that I put together. It doesn't really explain that much, but it does sound pretty cool. So I'm going to let you guys listen to that, and afterwards I'll explain to you what the business is all about. Spend enough time on the internet these days, you start to realize there's a lot of people who don't really understand where their food comes from, what's going on. I figured, hey, rather than complaining about this problem that I feel like the agriculture industry is facing, I should do something to fix it. My name is Clayton Lind. Um, the purpose of this business is to do one thing, serve agriculture. Thanks for listening to that guys. Um, I won't spend too much time explaining what Atlas Media Solutions is, but uh, Atlas Media Solutions is my media marketing company that 100% exists just to serve agriculture. Um, a lot of my time is spent on the road or on a plane traveling around the country producing high quality media material for different ag businesses. Um, and so if you guys want to learn more, please feel free to check out our website or follow me on Instagram. Um, but we just wanted to kind of plug this to let you know that because of this business that I run, it allows all of this um, stuff with Neil and the YouTube channel to happen in the first place. And so as long as we are sponsor free, I will continue to tell you that this podcast is brought to you by Atlas Media Solutions. And we are proud to say that we are um, here 100 percent to serve agriculture. So that's feel, guys. I'll let you get back to the podcast. Enjoy. Thanks. So here in Kentucky, that's one of the things we're dealing with this year is uh, continual pressure by the solar. We have a couple of solar farms trying to come into the area and they're pressuring uh, the landowners and stuff, yep. you know, for land. Um, I, I guess uh, I saw something the other day that says, you know, there's a certain percentage of American power that's going to have to be uh, supplied renewable pretty soon through either, I think natural gas may qualify as renewable, but definitely... Uh, wind and solar and uh, I think it's been very tough or it's been a difficult road for those uh, sources of energy to get much traction right. in America I mean they've yeah. have acquired a significant amount of land but for the amount of land they need has been difficult and I saw it uh, so I can't remember where I saw that it was one of the ag programs on network TV said that if they don't uh, start making inroads soon that they are going to consider eminent domain. So that's a scary thing to mm -hmm. hear that uh, if you are not willing to sell you, uh, sell them your farm or your rights to your farm for energy, they're just going to take it. Yeah. That won't be good. No, that won't be good. <laughs> I think you'll, you'll see. Some... I think they're, I don't know a whole lot about them and stuff. I, in my opinion, they're going down the right road. It's maybe better for the environment. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of pros and cons. Yeah. And it, I think there's a lot, a, I think there's a few different ways that you maybe get a lot more power for what you're doing. Yeah. And benefit communities a lot more. Yeah. What worries me a little bit is just, uh, we're already in the United States and really Canada too. Um, like we're at capacity for, uh, growing crops like we're using yeah. all our available land to grow crops we can't expand it much more um and if we're taking those uh that land out of availability for food and placing it into energy producing um industry then um then we become a importer of food mm -hmm. you know and it kind of it starts to shift the power balance a little bit yeah. so something i uh would rather not see. I know it's just part of uh, modernization or whatever, but it is a sad thing to see yep. come into the community and uh, and take away our beautiful green space and put up a bunch of. Uh, yeah, and that's the other side of it. There's probably a lot of lot of other land that's not useful for houses or anything else or crops that they could put them on. Yeah, and I always think, hey, there's lots of houses you can put solar panels on top of and yeah. and gather a lot of uh, electricity in just like that. Um, so, uh, so in your area, 
like here we have a river basis, um, but you're moving most of your grain on rail, correct? Uh, yep, and by uh, and by laker boat, I guess you might as well say. So if we're uh, when we're in harvest, we're going to the local elevator, uh, which is just down the road. We're we got three, three, four, five local grain elevators who also farm as well. They have elevators on their farms and they're commercialized and so we run to there generally sometimes we will ship to the port in hamilton uh or the ethanol plant at elmer right out of the field it just depends how you market your crop so in hamilton is that a like a lake port is that yeah. what that is yep so uh, what so lake is that, that comes it'll in? be uh so you'll be like your bungie and uh What's the other? I can't remember all the names. Richardson's but, and that. But they're like loading on the f- light freighter. And yep. then where does that grain go generally? I've never paid much attention to it. It can, I guess, can go wherever. Yeah. Yeah. It <laughs> so, goes. Does it go out to the open ocean, I guess? Yeah. Yep. Or to another port and gets offloaded onto the ocean liner if it's going across to China or yeah. Japan or wherever. Yeah. So, um, Let's see. What Usu- else do y'all want to know u- about Canadian? Usually, usually, I just get rid of my crop at the elevator and let that guy deal with it. Yeah. I've had enough. <laughs> yeah, let him worry about that. Oh, yeah. What else uh, differences have you seen in Canadian and American ag? Uh, the pace, I guess. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's slower, slower pace down here, but when it's time to get going, stuff gets done in a quick hurry. Yeah. And I guess we're... I'm used to the rat race of Southern Ontario is what I call it. Uh, some people may not think so, but um, seems like you're always in a hurry. Yeah. And we can get stuff done when it's time to go. We can get stuff done in a hurry, but it sometimes can get overwhelming and seems like you're beating your head against the wall. But yeah. Down here, it's I, it's just a much much slower pace in my mind. Yeah. Um, it's... Clayton said today, you guys, like, this is the easiest going farm around. <laughs> you guys aren't doing much, but um, everything's all done. Yeah. <laughs> it's We're pretty well ready to go, I think, until stuff hits the dirt. But it's it's just, a, it's slower paced. You can enjoy it more. Yeah. Or I do anyway. Yeah. Um, I Don't get me wrong. I still enjoy, if, as long as I'm farming, I enjoy it. So, but learning the different aspects of a different part of the world is very interesting to me as well. So, you know, in this air in the Kentucky, we're very much like uh, our Southern neighbors or whatever, a lot more than we are our, or our Northern ones. And uh, I think in the life in the South, really all time uh, has just been a slower pace and yeah. uh, people uh, take time to really enjoy their self. And, um, and around here, we just, uh, we enjoy each other, so we just well, we hang out as much as we do work yeah, on things. Yeah, but that's yeah, that's pretty much I guess what I I find. But when it is time to get going, I mean, it, you go and you get it done, and it gets done in a hurry. Yeah, it seems like to me. Yeah, so. yeah, we we can move a lot of grain in a hurry here, and it's a lot bigger. I guess open, bigger fields, open space. They're smaller ones too, but yeah, I used to I used to run a farm was a hundred and. 115 acres and i think it was in 12 different fields yeah <laughs> so that's the one thing i have uh like i know in like western canada agriculture and western ag they yeah. have the big sections and yeah, stuff do y'all have big. the section roads where you're at we're all mapped in a square that's yeah. another thing that gets me down here everything's like well there's a tree let's go around it yeah <laughs> well, <laughs> but yeah if in kentucky we're uh off the pioneer road so yeah, however the yeah. pioneer t- decided to to go around yon tree yeah is still how the road goes would, around yon tree. i can't i can't remember where i was the other night i was driving down a road i felt like it was in the guy's backyard i had to go around the corner and to stay on the road i just uh, every time it happens i, I still laugh at it but yeah. i'm not used to it yet it's but we're we're all in concessions where we are, so it's like two concessions north. You know, exact. It's straight pretty well. Yeah. But it's all when you fly over in an airplane, you can see it. It's all mapped and gridded, and they they did it 
so it was easy. <laughs> I don't think we have a straight road anywhere in our state. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> like it might be straight for a hundred yards and then it's I, making a hard turn. I haven't experienced it. If there is, <laughs> please show me. Yeah. That's what, uh, I had a, a few friends come down, a, a after the farm machine show and they were like, how do you even get equipment down yeah. the roads here? It's yeah. And that's the other part. Like we have wide shoulders, so we're, we can, we can stay on our, but down the first time I drove, uh, I guess it was the fall of when I first come down here. And I think we, I helped you finish beans for a week in November and you're, can you drive that? And I'm like, well, if I can, I'll figure it out before I get to the road. I got to the road. I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to hit something. <laughs> I couldn't believe how narrow they were. There's no shoulders. It's just pavement and ditch, but when you I, get used to them. You do. You, like you, you start to learn, hey, here's the four places I can turn around on, yeah. or I can stop or yeah. pull over on the way. You always, yeah. you always have that mapped out in your head. It's there's always the one lady that pulls up next to the mailbox yeah. uh, and you've got a mailbox on your side as well. And yep. where do you go from there? Yep. And we, that's, I mean, we get that too. We have wide shoulders. We're fortunate that way. It's a little easier to get around. It's still hard to move equipment around, but yeah. it's it's a little easier. It gives you a little more room anyway. Yeah. So, um, in, in your geography has, okay. So in our geography extend has been a problem, um, a little bit North of us where the orchards are and stuff. Are y'all experiencing similar problems there? Uh, yeah, a little bit. You just gotta be careful where you use it. And, uh, and it's like, we're, I guess a lot of us, I could, I can say a lot of us are moving to the enlist program now. Some guys aren't, but pretty big. Uh, it's a, I think the enlist pretty is big a switch to enlist. pretty big switch this year in its first full, yeah, full season and on soybeans anyway, not necessarily in corn, but um, it's a little safer to use and supposed to be better. So yeah, that's why not. Yeah. <laughs> And we, we saw, we saw some yield gain too. Out from, of the enlist. Out of the enlist beans to, from our extends. So yeah. Last year, I think we were half and half and that's a sprayer's nightmare. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that is a sprayer's nightmare. <laughs> so. That's a lot of clean out. And you're terrified you're going to the wrong farm. Yeah. We had, we had a whiteboard in the, in the shop and we'd call each other and it's, it was always go and look at the whiteboard. Well then, well, you weren't sure if that one got written right and. It just, yeah, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it is. That's, uh, I've, I've, you know, I've had a few people say, why don't you grow a few enlist beans? Well, I've, I'm scared I'll kill them. Yeah. So when I do, if, uh, if the, you know, if they do take that camp away as a trait, when I go enlist, I'll go 100% enlist. Yeah. And that's, I mean, we, we did it also partly because we're Ryan's in the seed too. So we, sure. we had to try something. If we won't grow it, how can you sell it? Yeah to your neighbors and right. other farmers, right? So Yeah, you you need to be confident about the genetics before you're passing yeah. them off. I mean they can they can tell you as a seed company that it's the latest and greatest thing and it's gonna yield, but it's all in all, if it isn't gonna perform on your farm, it, how can you tell somebody else that's buying from you a customer that it's it's good. <laughs> yeah. So that's one main reason why we had half and half last year, but this year we're like our operations are 100% enlist and it'll just simplify everything. And we had good coverage on our wheat pressure last year with it. So yeah, work good. And it's, yeah, it's a lot safer to use. Um, so what group beans are you growing there? So we're, our longest will be like a, I'm trying to think now what's on the order sheet. I think it's like a 2.1 or 2.2 maybe. Yeah. Somewhere in there, but it'll come in more at maturity. It'll probably come in more like a 1.9 perhaps. So Something if you're... like that. And then we get down in the 0.9s, 0 0.9 for like our wheat beans, like a 1.1 sometimes. Just depends on the year too. I mean, if it's early, you can extend it out. If it becomes late and you get into June, you might be looking for the one, all the ones you can get your hands on. Right. The shortest season you could just, possibly get. Just depends. Yeah, so for those of you that aren't uh, that don't know about soybean maturity, um, the lower the number, the shorter the maturity. Yeah. 
So just for instance, here in Kentucky, we usually start uh, in either a late group three, which would be like a three, five or later, uh, and go all the way up to a five. Yeah. Uh, so our maturities are uh, quite a bit longer than like what Ez would use in Canada. In the same amount of season. <laughs> yeah, in the same amount <laughs> like of season. Like the same, same amount yeah. of growing season. That's, yeah. that's just the that's just the climate, I guess you call it. It's, yes. It's hotter. The You got more growing degree days yep. and the nights are really warm here that's yeah. a big part of it everything grows 24 hours a day yeah and that's that's what i find is the biggest difference is like our corn will be a 90 90 not very much 94 day i guess in our own operations but like a 90 96 day to a 100 and we push it sometimes at 104 if we can get going in april yeah but you're playing with fire with frost and cool weather and stuff if it comes up yeah um like down here, it's 118, oh, 100, yeah. 120. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and and you can safely grow them without any threat of frost too. Yeah. And we're like, when we're going, when we're going to harvest, we're mid to end of October, November on 98 day, 100 day corn and planted last week, April in the first half of May. And it's down here, it's not much different, but it's 118, 120. And, we're thinking about going to the field on September 1st. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, you're probably, you know, you're really ready to show by yeah. the end. If, you, if you've never been here or you're not from here or never experienced it, it's kind of a head scratcher. <laughs> it is. Like uh, we can, you know, what's so amazing to me is we can take those long corns and plant them all the way into the mm-hmm. first week of June yeah. and still get a fairly enormous, normal harvest date out of it. Yeah. You know, fairly, I mean, you'll be cutting it a little bit wet, but normally not past 22 or 25. Right. So it's not like where we just hang at a 30% moisture and just stay there. So uh, let's see. What else do I want to know about Canadian agriculture? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's been your favorite thing about Kentucky? Uh, I don't know. I, d- I don't, uh, I wouldn't say I really good. I guess I've traveled a little bit. Uh, it's easier to get places. Yeah. I'm, I call it, I'm, I, tell everybody i'm right in the middle of the u.s i can go whatever direction i want and i don't feel bad about driving <laughs> yeah that is kind of neat about this and area or... that's i don't know i don't mind driving that's that's my choice of travel between here and ontario in the busy seasons so yeah i can i can generally do it between 10 and a half and 12 and a half hours it all depends on the traffic or yeah road conditions time of year stuff like that but um I like driving. I take a, I've taken a couple different ways and got off the beaten path for here and there a couple yeah. times just to see some different stuff. But it's uh, it's it's easy to get get to where you want to go. Yeah, if if you like, uh, you know, like if you like the Gulf, we're only eight hours from the Gulf. Yeah. Um, if you like the city, like St. Louis or Nashville or Memphis or Cincinnati, uh, we're within three hours of any of those. Yep. Yeah. I think Four my, hours of Louisville. I think my wife likes it. She's a lot closer to Florida. Yeah. The amount of, amount of times I see on the bank statement stuff out of Florida. I'm like, man, oh, man. <laughs> it is hard to beat it, though. <laughs> it is. It's so nice to go down there and enjoy some sunshine. Especially we get a little cool down here. And uh, I always like to say once it gets super, if it gets into the freezing <laughs> weather down here, which we don't get a lot of it, but when we do, I'm looking to go to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised I still got my sweatshirt on yeah. today. Yeah, as he, he's always... Uh, He's wearing a t-shirt and I'm sitting over there in my winter coat freezing. <laughs> I'm used to the cold. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to wait, I think, probably in April and make sure it's going to stay warm in Ontario. Yeah. I'm starting to get used to it. <laughs> so, um, well, uh, I guess that's about wraps it up. I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to get Ez on here and talk a little bit about, uh, the differences he saw and, uh, what do you, well, let's ask one more question. Is there anything you haven't enjoyed about the United States? That's loaded. I don't think so. Not yet. Yeah. I can't think of anything. Yeah. I don't know. It's, I wouldn't, so I don't know. No, not really. Not really. I don't want to chuck anybody under the bus right now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, it, all in all, it's been a good experience, yeah. I think. For me, I've learned a lot. There's still, yeah, you can learn every day if you got the ambition to get out of bed and go. Oh, that's so. for sure. Yeah, it's been a blessing to have it as here on our farm. Um, 
and I appreciate him joining us today. And you'll you'll we'll see as and hear more of him as uh, time goes, and we have more recordings and video here. He's he's here to stay. So uh, we appreciate you listening along today, and uh, always uh, appreciate your uh, listening and your viewership to our channels. Uh, like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for joining the Agriculture Podcast. Thank you.